Hello, I'm Charles Exley, one of the faculty advisors for Screenshot Asia Film Festival. I'd like to thank those of you who joined us for Screenshot Asia from October 6th to October 10th this year. On Thursday, October 7th, we screened the film As We Like It, an adaptation of Shakespeare's As You Like It, directed by Taiwanese artists Chen Hongyi and Wei Muni. Students in the East Asian Language and Literature Chinese program recited the famous monologue from that play, All the World's a Stage. And then the film was introduced by Dr. Alexa Joubin, who is professor of English, women's, gender and sexuality studies, theater, East Asian languages and literatures, and international affairs at George Washington University. This interview took place on Monday, October 11th, after the festival, and features additional discussion with Dr. Zhubang about the film and about her research, including her recent book, Shakespeare and East Asia, which appeared from Oxford University Press in 2021. For more information on what we're doing and where we're going, see our website at screenshot.pit edu. Thank you. So Shakespeare's As You Like It is one of his most famous comedies and it involves gender bending. Uh, first of all, in his times, uh, all the female characters were played by so-called boy actors. These were teenage apprentices before they, before they break their voice and they would play uh, women on stage, usually younger women characters. And that's really interesting because it's an all-male uh, theater culture. Women were not allowed to perform. So the two Taiwanese directors, um, Muni Wei, who actually founded a theater company called Shakespeare's Wild Th Sisters in Taiwan. That is really wild. So she's been engaged in, in Shakespeare for quite a while um, from a very feminist perspective. And her husband, um, Chen, who co-directs in this instance. And the two of them wants to pay homage to the boy actor culture in Shakespeare's times and kind of a bit of talk back and saying, you did not allow women to perform. How about we do all female cast now? And I, I applaud the film's innovation coming out of East Asia. This is um, the first full length feature film adaptation of this comedy. Uh, the comedy has been performed frequently through in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, um, Singapore, mostly on stage, really, in, tr in translation. And here they rewrote it into a futuristic Taipei. In terms of gender bending, they asked the actresses to play male roles, I believe. So all female cast, but the characters are not all female. And that in itself adds a layer, isn't it? And in this play, if you've seen the film, you realize it's about cross-dressing. So the main, uh, main character in Shakespeare and in here, right, Rosalind and Lorlin here, um, in pursuit of her love, she masquerades as someone else specifically as, as, as a male character. She gives, she gives her own character a name. Uh, I was really struck by that and how in Shakespeare's Art of the Forest, it's an enchanted place. You go there to discover yourself, to be transformed. And here, where is Art? It's in Ximanding in Taipei. Um, think of it as the coolest downtown hangout spot in Taipei. So that's not fictional, but they, of course, add fictional layer to it to make it kind of forest of art and thingy. Things there, as you see, are not what they seem. And most strikingly, it's an internal free zone. I, I love that. So imagine a world without internet. Um, and I, I love their kind of, a lot of the jokes. For example, we, we love express mail. Emails are fast, right? Text your friend. Um, Everything is fast. You want you want FedEx. There is the opposite, actually. The 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 delivery yeah, service. Yeah, the, the yeah. Slow service. Slow right? service. It's wonderful. Slow wonderful. service. On foot yeah. and deliver handwritten note. It's just amazing. And and you walk down aisles to pick out yeah. the, the character. So you can put a, a very antiquated style, but so retro that it's cool. So that I can print 
print your letter. And so um, that part, I think, is also echoing Shakespeare. In Shakespeare, when Rosalind is in the forest, um, she finds that her lover, Orlando, who doesn't know that Rosalind is here, right? She's disguised as a, as a boy, a Ganymede. Um, is it, or, Orlando is love struck, writes poems and stuck them on the trees and see it here. So the film is trying to replicate a bit of that that's in, in, the, in the messenger scene. And I, I really love this creativity. I should mention that actually, um, this is the Easter egg, there are two trans actors toward the very end. Um, and so you can see the effort they are making. Taiwan, even now, is still the only country in East Asia to have legalized gay marriage. Right, so it's at the forefront of queer culture. Um, they have the most colorful um, pride parade in East Asia every year. Um, so this film reflects where Taiwan stands right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. The, um, one of the things that really struck me about this, um, and I was interested to hear your thoughts just from the perspective of just performance, studies in general was that a lot of the, the scenes are crafted as kind of like a music video um, with a very intentional pairing of song and scene. Um, and that's, you know, especially apparent because the, the most famous, what I consider the most famous monologue in the entire right, play, the All the World's a Stage, is presented to us as the theme song, which appears, you know, repeatedly throughout the film. And I was just wondering if, you know, anything, you know, stood out to you of, of interest in that, in that sort of relationship between the, the sound and the performance. Yeah, there are plays within a play, this, they, they, they sing KTV, um, which is also an important part of Taiwan culture. And there's always uh, songs and music going on and you have to pay attention to the lyrics because even the characters do not express anything. I think the, the message is really embedded as Charles mentioned in, in the songs. Um, I, I, I love that in, the, uh, in expressing the famous speech, all the world's a stage and men and women merely players. They really take it to the next level to say these characters, they may or may not be real because the whole style is so psychedelic, isn't it? Maybe it's in your head. Maybe it's a dream of Rosalind who returns from, to Taiwan um, as a study abroad student in, in, in France. By the way, um, the actress is actually a French Taiwanese. So um, I believe she has main native fluency in French. So in the beginning of the film, you actually hear quite a bit of French from that character. It's very interesting how they bring in a global flair yeah. To, to a Taiwanese film. Of course, there's Shakespeare, so it's already global, but there's also Frenchness to it. Yeah. Very much diasporic. Um, no French songs, however. It's uh, newly written Taiwanese songs. Um, and uh, I want to point, kind of draw your attention to, there's a scene where Rosalind and Celia, her friend, um, the two girls who are very close to each other, they watch a Taiwanese opera. Yes. Unusual choices. You would think um, women of the age would, would go to the movies, perhaps. But, but that's very interesting. And they leave the opera actually carrying on singing what they heard on stage. And what's being performed on stage very briefly, this play within a film, is a love story. So it, another kind of hint, the whole film is about what is love, what is true love. And there's also a little speech, I believe, where we before we cut to an air to, to, to an airship in, in, in the sky, um, someone, uh, someone is on stage talking about uh, what love is and how the forest of Arden is actually a real place. So it's they, they cleverly kind of weaved some famous Shakespeare lines into the lyrics, into the, into the meta theatrical moments like that. That's fantastic. And is it true that um, you're, you called our attention to the, you know, Rosalind and Celia go to the, the opera, right? And so in addition to the play within a play dimension, um, is there something of interest in terms of performance history about specifically the Taiwanese version of opera performances 
Um, am I right that um, actually a lot of, um, also in that tradition, a lot of women end up playing male roles um, as well. And so there's a kind of a tradition within the opera scene too of women playing all of the roles. Um, that, that is so well said, thank you. Yes, Charles, very, um, very on spot. In Taiwanese opera in particular, but also some genres of Chinese opera, such as Yue opera in the Shanghai region. Um, okay. It's not an all-female tradition, but uh, conventionally, there are a lot of actresses. This is since the 21st century. Um, or on stage, they, they play male roles. Um, this, um, as you know, Charles, is, uh, is actually parallel to a important tradition in Japan, the Takarazuka musical theater. That's an all-female troupe. Um, and and, and, and the, the characters are mixed genders, but the, the, the cast is entirely female. So yes, there's a strong East Asian tradition of having women play any roles, including especially male roles, and they craft this image of ideal men that, that, that women fall in love with. And so they have a strong female fan base. And they are not lesbians, but they are often straight, but they will go there as an indulgent, as a bit of, ex for a bit of escapism, right? They can't find the ideal men in real life. A lot of them are married. They will go to theater and find ideal men actually played by a woman. Um, so in that sense, it might be said to be empowering because a woman portraying idealized images for other women for, for their consumption. Since you mentioned Takarazuka, and there's also the, you know, I'm thinking Mei Long Fang, you know, and I mean, there's a long tradition in Chinese opera as well of important um, cross-dressing. Is there, is there something specifically interesting about the East Asian tradition in this process? I mean, are there, are there just as many sort of gender crossing troops in other parts of the world or is what's kind of distinctive and uh, interesting about that in, in an East Asian context? So in East Asia, including the Sinophone world, there are generally two major kinds of theaters in the modern world. Um, one is known as, uh, as, as uh, Huaji spoken drama um, and its equivalent in Korea and Japan. So these are dialogue-based, kind of more westernized, realist theater presentations. Okay. The other is operatic, very stylized. The so think of Kabuki, No, um, and Jinji, uh, Beijing Opera, Taiwanese Opera, all of those. Um, they involve a lot of singing, sometimes acrobatics. And because it's stylized format, I think there's more gender crossing. Mei Lan Fang, that Charles mentions, uh, is really renowned in the early 21st century for mm -hmm. playing the drunken princess. He has numerous fe famous female roles and people specifically want to see his version. It's not mm -hmm. about uh, very similitude. It's not about how well he passes as a woman on stage, but rather the intricate gestures, for example, symbols, um, even the, the steps that he would take um, so he basically put the trademark on um, his version of women, specifically on stage. Uh, this has nothing to do with the actor's offstage life or identity or sexuality. It's, it's simply his profession. And so um, in the past, people used terms like female impersonators. Um, today, we see those terms as a bit problematic, you know, in an era of equality. So we call them actors who specialize in male or female roles. And I, I do like the freedom that we see in operatic genres in Asia, where um, the gender line is really blurred. The snow is there's no really fixed ways to present a specific character, uh, both male and female actors, mm -hmm. based on their training. If they train in the correct role type, they can take it on. Um, in the other genre, the more westernized, the Huaji genre I mentioned, it's more difficult. We don't see as, as much crossing there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's in line with post-Victorian Western theater as well. You don't tend to see. If you do see gender crossing, they often... It's, it's about making a statement 
or drag, right? Imagine drag on stage, it's perhaps to parody an idea, but, but in, 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 in Asian operas, it's simply taken for granted. You will go there not really for the story, you admire the skills, the techniques that they put in, and these people, they train from a very young age. I have a, a sort of a general question about maybe cross-cultural adaptation, uh, in particular, you know, it's one thing to set Shakespeare in a Western country that's, you know, very familiar to us. Um, and I'd be interested to hear um, your thoughts on what cross-cultural adaptation specifically can tell us, not just about, you know, Asian theater traditions, but maybe about, you know, bringing out aspects of Shakespeare that we maybe didn't appreciate otherwise. So in my, in, in my book, I, I did some research for this book, Shakespeare and East Asia, which was published by Oxford University Press. I found that when a famous work, a canonical work crosses cultural boundaries, what do you have? Actually, you have a lot of themes that are dormant in those stories. It's just that the Western traditions, they've gotten used to looking at stories in a certain way. And so those themes lie dormant. It's not that Shakespeare didn't write them, just the modern Western cultures are not used to think about them. For example, if I were to tell you the Merchant of Venice, the famous play about a pound of flesh and the Jewish money lender, how, how he wasn't a victim, but actually it was a comedy in Shakespeare's time. And he was the butt of the joke. We, I think it's very difficult for us to swallow. We live in a post-Holocaust, post 9 11 world. How can you say that? But, but in fact, Shakespeare's audiences, they went there just to see the star doing Shylock, who's, who's so, so much a character, right? So you can see such reversal. And Othello, Othello, it's about blackness, isn't it? Well, in Asia, it wasn't. It's not that they didn't understand the plight of of black people were not sympathetic, but rather they gravitated more toward, for example, the famous, um, that they, they see this as domestic tragedy. So they extrapolate different themes out of it. It's not a question of who is right or wrong, but I really enjoy this kind of crossing because it allows me to see a familiar story anew. It's completely fresh. The same story, but now you have a different perspective. Um, I always encourage my students, right? The world is beautiful. Don't insist on standing right where you are for your entire life. You could move a little and you see it slightly differently and that's beautiful. And move a little again. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like a diamond. You, 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 would, uh, it, you would actually lose a lot if you insist on simply staying here and gazing at it just from just one perspective for a lifetime. And that's what happens with Shakespeare. So canonical, so familiar, isn't it? And you hear to be or not to be, you think you know exactly what it means. Maybe not when you cross culture, you see all these creative rereadings of something that is supposed to be familiar. And, and sometimes they actually, sometimes accidentally, re restore something Shakespearean because they get back to the early modern roots that we've lost. Um, something politically incorrect, for example. And, and, and I think that's very useful for, for, for all of us um, in the Western culture. Uh, I want to pick up on one, if I understand correctly, Shakespeare in East Asia sort of starts around 1950 and comes to the present. And um, I'm interested to know, I'm thinking 1950s, you, you, you discussed Kurosawa, among others, right, in this uh, work. 1950s was the sort of first moment that, like, Japanese film was recognized, you know, in the West, in, in the film festival circuit, among other things. And I was, I was just very interested in what was it, to, to your mind, that made 1950 a really useful starting point for this, to trace this process? Thank you. Um, actually, there's more than two centuries of translations, adaptations, partial performances, not full plays. Uh, but 1950s was, was important because it's the post-war era mm -hmm. and the beginning of the rise of Japan in terms of exporting its culture. So when people think of global Shakespeare in, in Asia, very often Kurosawa is the most famous, most canonical, it comes to the mind. And most people know of Kurosawa. If you take a Shakespeare class, 
um, you shouldn't be surprised that Clarissa Howard simply treated like one of the Shakespeare directors um, because most instructors would not talk about the Japanese context. They would talk about adaptation just as if, uh, alongside with famous actors like Lawrence Olivier, Kenneth Branagh, and all of those. And the reason being that Kurosawa, is, uh, he, his Shakespeare films are infinitely, infinitely um, adaptable. They cross cultures quite well, so well that Japanese audiences, they actually write Kurosawa's name in katakana as if he's a as if he's a foreigner so this is an interesting case of someone falling through the crack in the west kurosawa represents japanese cinema even if there, there are a lot of uh, very important directors but, but he kind of becomes the spokesperson of japanese cinema because of the early his early entry into the western canonization process but in japan um, because of Kurosawa's blending of cultural expressions, Japanese audiences see him as somewhat foreign. So that's what happens when someone crosses borders so well. Um, and in the 50s, Kurosawa made films, not just adaptation of Shakespeare, but a lot of films, um, mostly in the samurai genre, to reflect um, whether, on the question of whether Japan, right, coming, emerging, um, emerging from the war, emerging from a, some, some of them regard as a shameful history of Japanese empire and uh, taking over of East Asia. So there's this, this disillusionment in Kurosawa's vision of the world and in human nature. And that's probably why he gravitated to places like Macbeth, like King Lear. These are really big tragedies. Um, these plays don't put much faith in human nature. They say, you know, humans are perhaps just evil, so inclined to hurting each other by nature. And, and Kurosawa is, is using Buddhism as a platform to explore these deep questions. And they resonate, I think, with the post-war generation, but also his techniques in terms of, in terms of um, renovating samurai films is really an expert in telling uh, an epic story. But not with an epic beginning. I'll give you some details. You are drawn into a forest. You are lost along with the soldiers like Macbeth and his friends. Um, and this actually ended up influencing very important Western directors, such as the Star Wars. You wouldn't think Star Wars have any relationship to Kurosawa, but if you look closely, if you look at Kurosawa samurai films, side by side with Star Wars, you realize how both films begin with minute detail. It's, it's a seemingly unimportant e in event and then it slowly slowly unfolds and you see the whole galaxy um, you will infer a lot of things so this is his trademark his signature and and that car got carried over um, by by quite a few western directors it's really important you have a lot of affiliations right now i mean you're a perfect you teach in what performance studies and in english and in women's studies. And I mean, you have a lot of different, and not to mention the Digital Humanities Institute, you, you work in a lot of different spaces, right? At George Washington University. And could you maybe say um, just something about the value of being multidisciplinary um, as a scholar right now? I mean, what, what advantages does that offer you? And um, how does that help us kind of work beyond, you know, the sort of typical pigeonholed, siloed kind of disciplinary formats that it's quite easy to complain about? Thank you, Charles. This is a wonderful question. Um, actually, I, 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 it's great to, to have to work in so many different spaces, like, like you so elegantly put it. It's rewarding because... Um, you see resonant issues across these spaces, digital humanities, um, critical race studies, Shakespeare studies. Um, you teach, in, in, in my teaching, I come across uh, very diverse audiences, students who major in international affairs, those who do social sciences, and those, of course, in the humanities, those who profess a love of literature, but we approach the same materials will have very rich conversations just because of the kind of people in the room. On the other hand, it's actually 
um, the beginning of all this, it wasn't that all glamorous because for all my life, I've been looking for a place to call home. I was born in Taiwan. I was educated here in the U.S., um, and now I'm married for Frenchmen, so I often feel I, I fall through the crack, like Kurosawa, um, across both, both sides of the Pacific and both sides of the Atlantic, neither place is tr really, truly home. And the same is true of my intellectual work. Um, depending on the context, sometimes people see me as, as a Shakespeare scholar who works with across different time zones, right? Because I, I look at it contemporary adaptations of Shakespeare, or as an Asian scholar who dabble in a number of Western disciplines, or as a digital humanist who bring race and gender to bear on each other. So um, neither of these fit entirely into one single department. And that probably led to my affiliation on all of these different departments, because that reflects the spread of my work and, and, and my, my audiences. Uh, Multidisciplinary work, it, it's, it's a kind of work that involves methods from different disciplines. And it's uniquely rewarding, but it's challenging as well. So one, one question is, who are you speaking to? Um, each discipline, they have their language. And if you speak a language that doesn't quite fit any, sometimes there's a lot of doubt. So there's push back and it's more difficult to, to get a grant to, to get the research done. Uh, on the other hand, the reward would be, of course, I'm always self-conscious of my language. Um, and English is not my first language. So, so when I speak of language, I'm talking about um, linguistic features, but also language in terms of, you know, the particular kind of language people in a, in a field would use to discuss an, an issue. Globalization, often seen as as quite in a negative light by, hum by most humanists. But if you ask a social scientist, globalization is not always negative. So that's just one example of kind of people hear a term and they already have presumptions. So I, I've learned a lot of precious lessons. And, and the benefit here is I try to write not in, in jargons or particular language of any discipline, but actually in a language of some people characterize as a language of public intellect, public intellectuals to, to, to speak beyond the ivory tower, to engage as many people as possible. I feel that it's my personal calling to do that in the time of hate we live in, right? Full of racism, misogyny and everything. Um, and one way, of course, people do this already in the classroom, but I think an, another way we could really do as scholars is to really to reach out and to reach out to, to general audiences, you would really have to break down disciplinary language and speak in a way that is not dumbing down, but it's simply a general language for discussing issues that concern all of us. Screenshot Asia Film Festival received support from the chancellor's office in part uh, because we feel like um, we presented this festival as a, as a really great opportunity to, you know, kind of fit in with some university goals. They call it embrace the world essentially, but um, fundamentally, you know, we kind of feel like we're doing the work of encouraging people to embrace diversity and recognize, you know, even within Asia, you know, a tremendous variety, right? And, uh, you know, multiplicity of, of cultures and races and languages, you know, all of these, all of these things. And I guess the, my question for you would be, um, do you also see the value of the humanities, right, in general, as serving this important role of, in a sense, helping people to start speaking the language of diversity, in other words, to recognize it, to learn to evaluate it respectfully, um, and, you know, in a way that kind of encourages students to become more comfortable uh, and maybe more cosmopolitan. Thank you, Charles, and um, kudos to you once again for your hard work on the 
Film Festival. It's a wonderful way to reach out to, to students and, and the community to make them become aware of the gems of Asian filmmaking, right? But also Asian culture through screen culture, something that is very concrete. You can always, especially now in the COVID era, we can't just travel to Asia, but at least you can travel intellectually through the beautiful films. I think it's really important to have something concrete. Um, in terms of the language, I absolutely agree with you, Charles, in terms of the value of the humanities in giving people the language to discuss difficult and uncomfortable issues, to discuss, to talk about um, that oftentimes people don't want to talk about certain things because they don't have the vocabulary, right? And I think that the humanities, arts and humanities can play a key role here. Um, just through general discussion like this, we can slowly pick up some vocabulary to help us along as we talk about, talk about issues. Um, and I think the films are especially helpful because it's a concrete narrative. It's a story you can follow and, and it's, in, it's in the third person. So when we discuss literature or film, we're not talking about, about ourselves. We're not pointing fingers at anyone in the room. We're talking about characters. And I think that is most excellent for thought exercises. If we can treat fictional characters kindly, perhaps we can treat our neighbors better next time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the same language you used to talk about characters, I think they would, they would carry over to, to, our, to our discussion in the society. But, but also, um, I feel um, when people think about diversity, a lot of them think of it as chore or busy work, think of, you know, a lot of schools, corporations, they have compulsive diversity training. So it becomes... Kind of people go through the action, uh, will go through the motion, and they think of it as a bit of busy work, or perhaps they don't want to be indoctrinated. Nobody wants to be lectured upon. That's where humanities come in. We don't indoctrinate people. We talk about characters. What does it mean to cross gender lines in as you like it or as we like it? Um, and in the process, it's, a, it's an organic, organic thought process, right? You would arrive at certain conclusions by yourself. It's not because people say it's politically correct to say X, Y, Z now, um, but rather uh, it's, it's always complex. I think always being black and white. Um, and that's what is lacking in fact in those diversity trainings here. We also have to do those as well. And I've been through plenty, you watch some videos, do a quiz. Uh, I think storytelling would be a very effective way going forward and I hope corporations and universities will consider that in the future. I want to spend a little bit of time asking you about this really amazing web platform that you've put together um, through, I guess technically it's hosted at MIT, but it's called Global Shakespeare's uh, and it has uh, video clips of performances from, I don't know how many countries, but many, many countries. Um, I watched the, I saw the, there's a pie chart that shows how many different countries have performances reflected there. Um, and um, I guess my, the question I like to ask about it is, um, what, what does having an online video archive of so many different performances help you to appreciate specifically about Shakespeare today? Thank you. Um, and for those who are tuning in, I invite you to visit the website. The address is globalshakespeares.mit.edu. That is plural, globalshakespeares. That's one word, .mit.edu. And uh, we have spent years collecting all these videos from all over the world. I am going to share my screen so you can all see it. Um, and the videos are vetted and they have a perma link. So unlike what you will find randomly on YouTube, they come and go, right? Here it's a scholarly, peer reviewed, vetted, subtitled database of videos from all over the world. And you can compare pivotal scenes, the famous scenes, to be or not to be from 30 different productions in 25 languages around the world, for example. And that's a real benefit because it's stable. You can do scholarly work with it rather than just referencing on YouTube. By the time your teacher reads the essay, the link is dead. 
for example, right? And and comparing so many, what's the benefit? You, you don't have to watch all of them in full length and become experts in all of them, but you can discuss in depth how these 10 different iterations of the famous to be or not to be, how do they express the intricate emotions? No, no single performance can capture all of it, isn't it? Like the diamond uh, metaphor I gave earlier, right? It's multifaceted. And that's why mm. it's great to engage with different performance versions. They are, they are variations. Um, you would have your own variation in your head as well, but I think you will become a more sophisticated reader once you engage with so many. The other, I really wanted to promote cross-cultural understanding, but how do you do that? Cross-cultural is simply set, easier said than done. Right? You can see a world map in front of you. So if it's, um, it, you can collect samples of diff, a cultural production of different parts of the world, but here, Shakespeare provides a linchpin, an anchor to all these materials. They're all different creative adaptations. Not all of them straight adaptation of Shakespeare, but with, with this, since you have a common denominator, I think cultural globaliz globalization becomes more, more concrete, something you can grasp, right? Because we are reducing the number of variants. And so that's one thing we are trying to do. And we have, as you can see, a list of all the countries, how many productions, of Czech Republic. Um, we basically cover um, all the world other than, other than um, sub-Saharan Africa. Don't have a lot of samples there. We have, oops. Um, we have North and South America. With South America, we emphasize Brazil as one of uh, our spotlights. We do have works from Mexico as well. Um, and we have, we have Northern, Western and Eastern Europe, as well as the Middle East, including Egypt. Um, not a lot of work out of Australia and New Zealand because of uh, issues with the union. So some places you will see um, it's copyright laws, some, some things are harder to collect. Some, some, some companies, they re insist um, on defining liveness as an exclusively live audiences. Though that culture, I think, is changing thanks to COVID, right? The Zoom culture, a lot of theater companies, in order to survive, they moved online. So we hope to continue to expand. But um, this is the only archive in the world that is free access. It doesn't require... Um, login. There, there are other similar ones focusing on the UK. Um, they're primarily by publishers and your library has to subscribe to them. It's actually quite expensive and focusing on, for example, Royal Shakespeare Company. So a collection of RSC videos, um, those exist, but um, they are not global in nature. We really want to push the idea that Shakespeare is a global author. And if you look at all these adaptations, you realize Shakespeare is not a white masculinist canon. He appears so because of the limited visions of Western critics, because of white critics. So we are basically restoring it, right? Um, you have an impression of how things are because of a history, right? And we have to be, become aware of that. It's not necessarily the truth. So we have to filter that out. And once you open your eyes, you begin to see how gender diverse Shakespearean canon is. And it's not really about England. Most of the stories already are set outside of England, right? And now you see the whole world engaging with this canon. They really bring more colors to it. So uh, please join us in exploring globalshakespeare.mit.edu. Thank you very much for being willing to share your insights about Shakespeare and East Asia with us. And um, if anyone is interested in learning more, obviously, the, um, apart from the Shakespeare, the Global Shakespeare's website that you've just shared with us, um, obviously, they can take a look either at um, Shakespeare and East Asia, your latest publication from Oxford University Press, um, your book on race from Routledge from 2019, maybe? And um, is there anything else that you'd like to you know, recommend for people who want to find out more information on your research? 
I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, in this recorded interview. And if you're curious, you can find, find out more about my work at my website, which is ajobin.org, A-J-O-U-B-I-N.org. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much.